introduction. For the last five years, um, we've had a project, a uh, research project on urbanization in Africa, the Center for Economic Performance at LIC, joined with Oxford and with the World Bank. Uh, in the first session this morning, we saw a presentation about an early report um, on that research project, and today I'm going to sort of update or build upon uh, that report. So I'm an economist. Um, I tend to oversimplify as economists do, and too often ignore the human side, but I've only got 15 minutes. Um, I'm an academic researcher, so I'm going to present way too many facts for you. But the intent is to um, evoke or, or perhaps provoke uh, some discussion and, and thought. So uh, let me proceed. Let me try this. Okay, so I'm going to talk about building productive and livable cities. So the first issue, and this came up in the earlier presentation, what can a city do to be competitive and to, to thrive economically? So, you know, traditionally towns serve agriculture, um, and in the modern world you have uh, resource-rich countries with low populations that sell oil, and they have vibrant cities because they've got a lot of revenue to pay for. Most countries and most cities are not in that kind of position. In order to thrive, they need to produce something that they can sell to the rest of the world. Traditionally, that's being manufacturing products. Today, uh, some of it is certain types of services, like education um, and financial services. What I put up here is, uh, well, first of all, two facts about just looking at other countries. In China, when we look at cities, about 40 to 50 percent of employment is in manufacturing. Uh, in historically, in the United States, say about 40 to 50 years ago, before it morphed more into services, it was about 30 percent of employment in cities was in manufacturing. In these pie charts here, the two colors you want to look at, one is the blue, which is agriculture, and the other is the brown, which is manufacturing. We've got for data for 12 countries, we've got urban, rural, and then separated out the primate city, which isn't that different uh, from the general urban. So you see several things. One is that the rural sector in Africa is almost entirely agricultural. If you look in China or you look at India, that is not the case. Agriculture might be 50% of employment at, at most. There's a lot of other things going on in the rural sector. The second thing is when you look at Africa, that a large proportion of people living in cities actually still report their occupation as farming. They own a farm somewhere, they do some out commuting, whatever the case may be. But only 10% of employment is in manufacturing. So the question, and then their services, which are the green, that's business services, financial services, what can African cities produce to export to the rest of the world to thrive in, uh, in the long term? And that's a, that's a big challenge. So how do you make cities competitive? There are many um, aspects to that. Some of them we're going to discuss on the panel here. There is the idea that came from this morning that Africa at, say, 40% urbanization roughly as a, as a, as a subcontinent. Um, has an income level that is much lower than other regions of the world when they are at that level of urbanization. That means there's very limited resources to draw upon to do the investments that are needed. So what do you need? You need skills, you need general schooling, um, Africa um, lags in that, you need technical training, after schooling to try and match what employee, employers need and, and the skills that they need. African economies are uh, characterized by a high degree of informality. That means very small firm sizes, a lack of um, exploitation of scale economies, often a lack of uh, adoption of new technologies. So why is it? Is it access to uh, the capital markets, lack of access to banks or venture capital? Is it, in some cases, regulations in the formal sector that make it difficult to move from the informal to formal sector and keep firm sizes small? And then a key aspect that we'll talk about today is transportation. The rails, the 
roads and uh, the, the highways ports. So we have a Trans-Africa highway system. It does not basically have limited access multiple lane highways. Paved in some points, not paved in other points. Things move very slowly from the interior to the coast. There is now a move, right, to do massive investment in this. The question is, where does the money come from? And one of the trade-offs that up, up there is how much debt do you incur in the case of, say, Chinese investment, which is, is debt to the Chinese government, um, versus how much do you sort of put into infrastructure today. So with the debt, you're taking your future generations and imposing a burden on them to, uh, to repay that debt. So um, the role of economic density, I'm going to talk about that for a while. And, and um, economists, economic geographers think economic density is absolutely critical. They talk about externalities, firms being close to each other, learning from each other, um, a bigger market, better matching between workers and employees. A, a simple example, advertising in New York City. In the southern part of Manhattan, there are about 1,200 advertising agencies. And you know, studies indicate that if you're in a cluster of firms that are within a half kilometer of each other, that has enormous impact on your productivity. It's just an exchange of ideas um, and advice on how to respond to a request for a proposal and an advertising campaign. It's really very important. We look in Africa, and this is data based on uh, six countries. When you move from uh, a household, a similar household from the rural to urban uh, sector, that about doubles household income. But then when you look across just cities, and you go from the least dense to the most dense cities, from the fifth to the 95th percentile, the increase in income is about 170%. It's a huge amount. Density is really important. There are no African cities in the top 40 most dense cities in the world. How do you measure density is an issue, but um, uh, that seems to be the case. So how do you get um, economic density? Well, there are various features. One is the transport system. So if you look in Dar es Salaam, this is data from 2010, um, about 70% of households uh, walk to work or ride a bicycle, but mostly it's by walking. If you're walking, you can't cover a great distance. It means that workplaces are going to be dispersed so that people can get to work. And you're not going to have these enormous clusters of economic activity that we think is so important uh, for, uh, for productivity. And then we have numbers uh, from that time period for Addison, Nairobi, about 45%. So what is the impact of, say, investing in public infrastructure? So we have an example historically from London. London uh, invested uh, heavily in the 19th century in uh, overground rail coming into the city of London, not all the way into the city, but to the to, uh, boundary around the, the city of London. And then the underground system started construction in 1862 and continued on into the main part of it. With that, I mean, one key little fact, people on average, before the building of this rail system, were walking one to two kilometers to work. After the building of this, they were commuting five to six kilometers. So they moved from a kind of a walking environment with workplaces dispersed around the population into a world in which there was a lot, lot more clustering. So in the actual city of London itself, Employment tripled in this time period, and actually people left. There was you converted the city of London to a dense um, economic activity area uh, with many fewer residents. If we look in the modern world, in Bogota, the building of the Transmillennial, right, which is the kind of poster child for bus rapid transit for BRTs, studies indicate that it's having a similar effect, that it is leading to greater clustering of employment and longer commuting distances by people so that because it's easier to get around the city. And the hope is we have Dar es Salaam, as you know, has, has opened up a BRT, plan many more lines. Um, uh, you know, the second and third line, I think, are now financed and are starting this. And we, we think it will have a profound effect um, uh, on the city 
the ability for firms to cluster and for people to be able to get to work. Another part of economic density is arguably building high. So building high requires private property rights, either leasehold or freehold. Why? Well, you're going to put a lot of money into a particular uh, spot. You don't want to have expropriation. You're going to need financing. You're going to want insurance. You want to have clear rights of succession for the property. That comes with private property rights. So if you look at the city of Nairobi, today it's about 90% of the land is under private ownership. Now the path to that was, was really tortured and, and extremely corrupt. I'll come back and talk about that. Dar es Salaam, on, on the other hand, at most, absolutely at most, about 25% of residential plots have these CROs, which are early sold rights. So if you look at these cities, they're dramatically different. 85%, this is the bar graph here, are buildings in a Dar es Salaam or one story. Um, in Nairobi, it's like under 40%, and then you have a distribution. The visual on that is this. So in the top corner, uh, we have uh, Dar es Salaam. We have some, this is building heights, right? Average on a grid square. So we have some height there in the city center, but most of the city is absolutely flat. Okay? You go to Nairobi, you have, first of all, higher density in, uh, in the sense of building high in the center. Three minutes, wow, okay. Um, and, uh, and throughout the city. So, uh, you know, Dar es Salaam is going through a process of, of trying to have more title and more privatization, but it, it's a slow process. You need a vibrant construction sector um, in Nairobi in a 12-year period, right near the city center, not in the city center, but just outside in the, in the core. You have like 35% of buildings are torn down, 50% increase in volume, a three-fold increase in height of buildings from those that were torn down on average to those that were put up. There's a key issue about this, and it's uh, livability and, and thinking about Nairobi and Dar es Salaam in this context. So here I've kind of said, well, Dar es, you know, Nairobi's felt high, they've got this, uh, this economic density. On the other hand, what you see across Africa is very different rates of home uh, ownership. So in Dar es Salaam, 51% of people owner occupy. In Nairobi, it's only 17%. 83% of people rent. And you see then in the list of other countries, Nigeria, Ghana, and Uganda with very low rates of owner occupancy, uh, Mozambique and Burkina Faso with much higher, as, uh, as well as Tanzania. So why does that matter? Well, in an urban environment, property values are rising um, over time, and who's going to get that benefit? Is it going to be spread throughout the population of people who own, or is it going to be the elite who own the building stock? It's, it's a really complicated question, and then there are the issues, of course, of upkeep and investment uh, in homes, which tend to be better under owner occupancy. So the last thing I'm going to talk about, since I've limited time, is slums. What's their role? We argue in the research that we do, this is a very obviously cheap way of providing housing. Um, it's a good, perhaps, way to do it on land that is cheap near the city edge. Um, you see slums in, uh, in Nairobi on private land near the city edge, not at the city center, but near the city edge. If you look in the city center, of course, you have, or the core part of the city, not the city center, you do have massive slums, and we think that is, uh, is a market failure. So, I'm going to finish with the Cabrera story here. These are so-called government-owned slums. They were originally a land grant to uh, the New Yorkers. 1911, by the British for fighting in the King's rights. Okay. Um, at independence, their rights to the land were revoked. Um, they retain, uh, I guess, a moral claim on the part of Cabrera that uh, they occupied. But the rest of it, and much of Cabrera, is operated with slum lords. They're on, they have no legal claim to the land. It's corrupt, it's very profitable. And the majority of units are owned by people who are politicians and bureaucrats. That makes it a very difficult political problem to say we want to take this land and redevelop it. 
There's a huge gap in the land values here between the formal use and this land that's in the core of the city in older slums. So we sort of look at this and said, if you paid off, not the moral part of this here, but if you paid off these illegal landlords for the value of their land in perpetual slum use, developed it in the formal sector, there would be about a seventeen dollars to $18,000 per household gain for slum households. That's a huge amount of money on the table. They're only paying five or $500 to $700 a year. Now, that's a practical solution. You pay off these illegal landlords who are also politicians and so on. And the, the social justice, I, I would give the tenants ownership to their units and allow them to uh, sell them off, but that's not going to happen in this world. So, um, let me say, there were two other slides I had. I'm out of time. One is on livability. I don't have a lot to say about that, except it's really important, and we're going to hear about that in the conference. And the other is on government finance. We're also going to hear a lot about that.